Schneider with the Radical Clinic Charitable Foundation, and thank you for joining us for another one of our endometriosis family support groups. Uh, for those of you who are new, we do these monthly, and they fall on different um, days in the beginning of the month, but um, you can keep the, on our webpage and on Facebook um, for information about when we're coming up next. So I am going to introduce Jillian Burr. She's from the Endo Coalition, and she'll be sharing with us tonight. Thank you. Me while I get this shared guys. So my name is Julian Schur, and I am one of the board members at the Endometriosis Coalition. I just want to apologize that Jenna was not able to make it today. Uh, she had something come up, but she wanted to give you all her best. Um, she has my hands for tonight. So just to get started, um, the Endometriosis Coalition is a nonprofit, and we are dedicated to uh, spread providing resources and education and promoting research and reliable education for endometriosis. It's kind of an interesting story of how I got started. Natalie Archer and Jenna Bakari are our founders, and they just recently met in person for the first time about a week ago in New York, and so they found each other via social media, and they just were both fed up with how things were going, and they wanted to bring awareness to this disease. And they both, both worked time and began this nonprofit, and then I came in and found them via Instagram as well. And if it hadn't been for them, I wouldn't have been able to find my surgeon and be speaking with you now um, as free person. So, a little on my story, I have a very quick diagnosis. Usually, the delay in diagnosis is an average of 10 to 12 years is the recent um, estimate. So I only, it only took me two years to get diagnosed. But what essentially happened was I had been on birth control for nine years. I had abnormal cells. I had HPV that would not go away for 10 years. So when I stopped taking birth control, I started seeing every time I would have sex. And it wouldn't be during sex. It'd be right after, and it'd continue for a couple of days. I went to my doctor. I'm like, listen, this is happening. Um, it's painful. I'm in pain for days after. I don't know what's going on. And eventually, I, I was told that it was my fault, that it was because of the HPV and my abnormal cells, that they're probably progressing, so let's do another biopsy. So I did another biopsy. The cells are still the same that they were. This was my sixth by time. Yeah, I have a medical science background. I was pre and have a degree in human biology. I never heard of endometriosis. Never endometriosis brought up in conversation with my doctors at this time. They never said that this that this be anything related to endometriosis. That essentially it was my normal cells that was was causing bleeding and the pain during sex. So I moved moved back to Texas and went to my OB guy that I had seen since I was 14, and she did a um, ultrasound where they put the foot in the uterus to look for pups. We did another biopsy. We tried the IE in the arm. That made me bleed more. I was bleeding constantly. Um, we did double birth control, everything they could possibly think of because they kept just saying it was probably my abnormal cells and it was my cervix and that there's nothing they could do. So I kept like, no, I'm not going to take these meds anymore. Like, I won't take pain meds. And I'll get into a little bit of that later of how I meds at that time, but I kind of regret it later on because I was not able to get them when I actually did need them. But I didn't know what the cause of my pain was. I didn't take something that would cover up the pain. I wanted to know the root cause of the pain and the symptoms before I would take a medication that would cover up those symptoms. Um, so that I got the double birth control thinking, you know, it's just birth control. 
physical harm can, can that be not cover up anything like pain meds. And I was just very feisty about it with my doctors. And I think the main point of my story is that, that be your advocate. So I was in the office, I was doing research on my own, and even in my research looking at my symptoms, I never found endometriosis. There wasn't any resources that I could find that my symptoms listed. Doctors in my practice were talking amongst each other of, we know what's going on with this girl. Like, we can't get um, symptoms up. She's not reacting to any of the medications. I was double birth control when I was killed at my desk at work in the worst pain I probably ever had. And my boss was like, you're going to the doctor now. They could get me in, and they did an ultrasound where they had found that I had several cysts that had ruptured, ovarian cysts that had ruptured, and that's when I first heard of endometriosis. And then you may have endometriosis, the only way to diagnose it is through surgery, and we don't want to do anything that invasive. And I was like, well, if that's the only way to diagnose it, and at my, I didn't know how to treat it at that time either, I was like, let's do the surgery. I was able to get in and have my first surgery in July of that year, and I did find endometriosis, and excited. And I'm sure if you mean have endometriosis yourself, or family members do, it's a very exciting time to find an answer to your to your pain. But at the same time, to be told that it's something you're going to live with for the rest of your life. So I kind of just put off a Oh, we took care of it. We got it out. Well, I was good for three weeks after surgery. Um, a few more of my symptoms that were um, kind of somewhat to me, everybody is very individualized of what their symptoms are. I never had a history of painful periods when I was growing up. I did have irregular periods, but they were painful. Um, I couldn't remember anything along those lines of having as like one of my main symptoms. I had night sweats. I had very heavy, felt like, like blood was just dragging down my legs, and I had been a runner before I got sick, and I just could barely even stand up during the day. Um, so I was good for three weeks. Then I got again. Everything started coming back. I didn't know at the time what the proper treatment for endometriosis was. I was told that having a baby would cure it or I would be good. And I was 20 times single, and I'm still single a few years later. And I can't have a baby and have kind of a myth as well, but I was like, I need to find a way to manage this. And the other myth is that a hysterectomy is a cure for endometriosis, and it is not, as the endometriosis lesions actually create their own estrogen. So without proper excision surgery, of all endometriosis, you can have recurrence and you can still have the pain. So I went to a fertility doctor because I thought that a hysterectomy was a cure. I had my hysterectomy scheduled. I had a retroverted uterus. So he said that for the hysterectomy based just on symptoms and past, um, he was with it. My surgeon, my vagina was not. So he was on the board of the hospital and said, I know that this is going to come before the board. No matter what you sign, like I can't, and I, that's in full um, interest, I cannot do this for you. So I'm glad it didn't happen then. Um, I didn't know at the time that it wasn't a cure. I thought that there was something wrong with my uterus, but not sure exactly what it was. Um, I didn't get that then. I was referred to another surgeon in the same practice who was to be an expert on endometriosis. Well, I went in with him and did another ultrasound where he found a mass on the transvaginal ultrasound somewhere between my and my rectovaginal canal. He was exactly sure what it was. Um, so he was to do, I did try that back sign. I have a family history of colon cancer. And though I was young and, and a cousin, he still wanted to be extra sure that it was not so we did that to see if it was in my colon back back okay and then to do a colonoscopy endoscopy 
and if they didn't find anything on those, go back in and do a laparoscopy. So I was kind of I took it then. I said, no, you can do it all at once. You can go in, put under, do the colonoscopy, the hysteroscopy, and the laparoscopy all at one time. Colonoscopy was fine. Hysteroscopy was fine. And the laparoscopy, he found more endo in my rectovaginal canal. That mass was a large chunk of it that had been missed on my first surgery. So that surgery, again, three weeks I I was good. I felt great. And that's sick again. I was in the position working as a disease intervention specialist in public health, but I knew that I wanted to go to law school. So I had to take my LSAT, and I was getting sick, and I was having to work from home. It was taking life. And I, okay, well, what can I do to figure this out? Um, I was moving to Chicago or to Indiana, and he found me a pelvic pain specialist in Chicago. And so I went to her and commuted two hours each way there, and she referred me to a gynecologist through her office. That surgeon ended up doing my fourth surgery. So I moved in, moved to Illinois and Chicago for law school, and I ended up having to have my appendix out, which was not a surgery I had had planned. Um, and most likely it was due to endo, but they would not tell me because it was just the general surgeons. However, they referred me to that again. I thought that they were an expert in endo. I had no idea what any of the resources were, um, and so that of how I found my excision pin and how you, you can do the same or refer to others that you think endo because really should be one surgery done right. I had three surgeries for endo, not wrong but done incompletely. So they did excise the surgery, or excise the window, but find it all because they didn't do a true excision surgery. But one that my doctor in Chicago did do is refer me to a floor physical therapist. I did not even know that this was a thing. I had been living with endo for a year at the time. Um, I am a very tense person naturally. Uh, I think my the therapist now says I don't tap into my parasympathetic nervous system enough, so I'm very tense. And when you're in chronic pain, you're constantly tensing up, and it really does translate all down to the pelvic floor. So what I found to be really helpful for me with pain and with sitting and drying is the floor physical therapy and the dysfunction. I had no idea what it was going in. I didn't know what they would do when I got there, and it really designing the right physical therapist for you, making sure that, that you do, they are specialized in this and that they're as comfortable with it as you are, but it is, it was changing for me. And it did take a bit to get comfortable with it, only because the first physical therapist I saw didn't really, she wasn't as comfortable with it as I was, and so I feel uncomfortable. Um, if you haven't the floor physical therapy or if you're interested in getting involved with it definitely go to your doctor and ask you know who they recommend in the area do some research look at you know, reviews of patients that have been there uh, I was lucky that the one I saw at the Lutation Institute to my surgeon's office later on in Chicago but I'm going to show you kind of what we do at the Endoco with bringing all of this into um, awareness and how you you can get a disciplinary approach to things. So hopefully this works. So Instagram. And this is done a stretch that I do to help with my low back, glute, and leg pain. I had a lot of issues with that area of my body, especially my hips, my back. And I didn't think it was any gender related until I began physical therapy. So it's not just the internal, but after surgery, you have scar up, so scar tissue massage in your abdomen is big, and, you know, rebuilding those muscles that when you're in pain and you're not using them are going to kind of the weekend, and it's definitely hard for me after my last surgery to kind of get them built back up. So this was a really important part of my recovery, and I'm still going to physical therapy 
even though I don't have pelvic pain, I still do have some tight muscles on my pelvic floor, usually around the hip area. So we do work on those, which teaches me these stretches and different strengthening things that I can do when I'm having a flare. This is huge when I'm having a flare after sitting all day. Um, and it's one thing that's really great about uh, why Doc in Chicago did for me is referred me to this resource. So even though these that they referred me to do another excision surgery through the, like it really did help my pain. It not my way, but it was something that would help me cope with my pain during flares. So I go on to the endometriosis discipline. I had four surgery. And right before that, I had met Natalie, one of the co-founders on Instagram. And it was like, like have Nancy's nook for endometriosis education. I was like, no, I haven't. Come that there is an excision specialist in Chicago, um, my surgeon, Dr. Lodd, and I was able to get in with him. However, I go into a little bit of endometriosis versus adenomyosis. Because I said earlier, hysterectomy is not a cure for endo but the cure for adenomyosis, which is a related condition where it's the tissue, the abnormal tissue grows inside the muscle wall of the uterus rather than outside of attaching to the organ. So they I had adenomyosis, so my fifth surgery that would have been my true excision surgery asked to be a hysterectomy as well. So I am about four months post my hysterectomy, um, and it was they do suspect it was adenomyosis based on how my uterus looked. Um, I had a feeling that that was what was going on due to some of my symptoms and just kind of a personal um, intuition that I felt something was right. And they did only find endo on the outside of my uterus and some adhesions. Um, so any questions about that, please feel free to ask um, in the Q&A session. But I wanted to do a little bit of the endo myth dispelling. So, if you go to endometriosis, and when I go on dates and I'm being, I'm told I'm part of this nonprofit or before part of the endoco, I was like, I have endometriosis, they would Google it. Um, the first definition to pop up is, is incorrect. So endometriosis does not displace endometrial tissue. The most recent and accepted published definition of it is that it is, that that is similar to the endometrial tissue, but exactly it is the same. So, don't, it's still likely different from the functional glands and stroma that compromise the, endome, compromise the endometrium. Essentially, these, the tissue that is endometriosis is not the same tissue that you are shedding every month during your cycle. There are differences to it. And so, it kind of goes into the next myth is that. Hormones are not a cure for endometriosis. So I will say, and I will admit that I did take the Lupron shot, which is the put you into clinical menopause. I did it for about a year because I was of options. I needed to make it through my first year of law school. Um, I had a very large scholarship running on me being able to make it to class. I feel very sick. It helped me a little bit, but I was still in the ER every four weeks at least. And so the reason they do not treat and they do not cure endo is because endo can create its own estrogen. So while these treatments shut off your brain from telling it to produce estrogen and produce your hormones, the endo lesions, if, they, if they're still there and they have not been exercised properly, will create own hormones and that will allow it to grow. So actually a lot of it is kind of a band-aid. And it can still, if you band aid, then the endo can be inside growing and you not know it. The standard of treatment is excision surgery. And if you have not had excision or if you're not sure if you had proper excision, um, on research your surgeon, but also Nancy Snook has a list of surgeons. And it was an amazing resource for me. Okay. So. Another myth is that endometriosis is only found in the pelvis. Um, one of our founders, 
genitals. She actually had the thoracic endo. So it can be the GI tract, urinary tract, diaphragm, and lungs. And it's really important to keep a list of all of your symptoms, things that you may not think are related to endo. For instance, I didn't think that night sweats or um, my hip pain or my back pain had anything to do with endo, and it did. So there's like nausea, constipation, painful urination, chest pain, and shortness of breath. They're all symptoms of endo because it is not only found in the pelvis. So a lot of people have a lot of GI issues because endo can attack the colon and rectum and your intestinal tract. Um, it's to really take like close it and kind of monitor your symptoms around the different times of the month and definitely, you know, track of everything, even if you don't think that it is related. Um, so because of that, I did a lot of research on my own, but through the Endoco, I have made friends with people across the world. I have these two business partners that without them, I wouldn't have found my excision bin and I wouldn't be you're talking to you as a law student being able to function and also helping run a nonprofit. So a few of these resources that really helped me um, and others is Nancy's Nook, as I said. Um, if you have family members who don't really understand endometriosis or you, you don't understand endometriosis, I didn't for the probably first two years of my of life that I didn't really understand it truly until about a year ago. Um, the Endo What film is an amazing way to show those or to learn yourself and see others going through it as well. And the Resources Center for Endometriosis Care, um, Dr. Sonero is amazing. They do amazing work and advocacy. They're on Instagram and Twitter as well. Uh, they have a lot of educational resources and stay up to date on the research as well as Endopedia, which has some research in different information that you can go and look for to make sure that you're getting the proper information. There's a lot of things out there, a lot of groups that aren't giving correct information. They may be a little bit misleading, but underlying that. Uh, so we definitely want to point in the right direction. And as well as our Instagram, our Twitter, our Facebook, we are very active. If you message us, we will write back as soon as possible. Um, we just love having such a large community of everybody else to um, come together and support each other. And in our recent campaign, we had um, mothers, fathers, brothers, husbands, boyfriends, partners, uh, nephews, nieces, all coming together to do the 1 in 10 campaign. And it was just amazing to see how many people really are impacted by ENDO. It's not just the 1 in 10 of us, it's also our support system. So I think it's really important to spread awareness and talk about endo as much as possible. Um, so when I'm dating, I tell people before the first day I have endometriosis, I will talk about it. I don't shy away from it. Um, you know, it's hard for me to deal with telling I have endometriosis or being sexually intimate with them and being like, I may bleed on you. I'm sorry. So there's a lot of support in these resources as well as us um, to have those talks with someone else who's been through it or to you want to be pointed in the right direction of a surgeon or a physical therapist or healthy eating, we're there for you. That leaves the questions. If everyone looks to the left side, there's a Q box that you can type into, um, or you can send me. Uh, my name is Megan Elder on there. You can send me a private chat if you don't want it to go into the Q and A, and then I'll go ahead and read those for Jillian. Uh, but Jillian, I was wondering if first you could share how people can connect with the Endoco and where they can find you guys. Oh, Allie. So we are on Instagram and it is at the Endo .co. I am and on Facebook if you search as well. We have our website as the co and on Twitter because Twitter doesn't allow periods. It is the co all one word. Great. So the question is, what does double birth control mean? Sorry, the 
taking two birth control pills a day. So it was double the dose of what someone normally would take. It, they were trying to stop my ovulation and everything completely. Okay. Next question is, are you hopeful for the future of endosurgeries being more complete or more effective? I think we are heading in the right direction. If you go to Instagram page or endo what, um, there's the American College of Gynecologic Surgeons, it's ACOG, um, they are the ones who set the guidelines for how surgeons and how billing should be done. And right now there is a patient protest and a lot of being going on because they will not read doctors who do it correctly the same or more than those who do it incorrectly. So there's been a lot of advocacy lately and a lot of awareness. And I think the more that we can emphasize that, that in surgery done correctly is the best treatment. And, and there is of research showing that. Um, I think it, I am very hopeful and I don't think we'll have fighting until we see that. Uh, I guess another thing I'd like to say about that is I had, they did excise my window, uh, but they were, I was only under for 30 minutes to 45 minutes max on my, my first surgery. I have been under for about two hours for to get a look at all the different areas where endo could be. And so for my hysterectomy, which was an excision, he did excision as well, looked at everything. It was about two and a half hours. Okay. Our next question is, what language do you use when explaining endo to people you date? I'm very just blunt about it. I say that I have this chronic illness and it's called endometriosis and it does impact my life a lot but I make it, it I can deliver in a positive tone because it it's part of me but it doesn't define it and I think that if they understand that it's stuff that I'm living with but it's also going to impact them like I may be sick like, to help me or there will be times where I can't have sex with them I think it's really important from the start, and those who will around will stick around, and those who don't, it's their loss. But even if I scare someone away by it, I'm okay with it because they on the line, they date someone, and they get that their grand or their wife gets diagnosed with endometriosis. Be aware that that is a thing, and so it kind of puts it in mind of you know this is something that you know women suffer with and transgender as well. Um, I like to kind of just spread awareness, and I tell them very kind of bluntly. And if they ask questions, but I do say don't Google it. Um, they always do Google it, though. So I try to point them in the right direction of like looking at the doco. And when they're at, they'll see my personal story. So we do do feature Fridays, and, and the of us have our personal story on there. So they do see that, and I think you really explain it to them that's most comfortable for you and then work out really well. Your next question is, I still have endometriosis symptoms after menopause. Then some conflicting research on that Other people see a decrease in symptoms. That is where the treatment of the Lupron comes in is why they use that is because it shuts off the estrogen. If you don't have any active endo in your body after menopause or at any time, you shouldn't experience any endo symptoms unless it's from adhesions, um, from surgery scar tissue adhesions and things like that. But there is some conflicting research on that. So I don't want to say yes or no. It is, is very individualized as well. Um, but I need to just discuss with your surgeons and your doctors and some, some Surgeons, they have like a menopause or sexual health specialist in their office as well. I don't know if any of them do remote consultations, um, but it is something that is individualized and the word is kind of, um, so I don't want to say yes or no. Great. Okay, next question is, if you don't mind, do you have any advice on how to tell someone I'm going to date that I've had a hysterectomy? 
find it all. Um, so I have all the last two that I've dated. Um, there, I, I, I was dating app and I just disappeared. I stopped talking to him and deleted my app because I, I was having the surgery and I feel like dating at the time, but then back on the app and rematch with them. And I was like, I had surgery and they're like, Oh, are you okay? And I, for some reason, I'm just so, I'm just, I have to direct me. So I don't know what that means. So I had to draw a diagram out before I date to explain what a hysterectomy is. And, and I did my ovaries. I told them they could take them if they wanted them. And I to my surgeon the same. I, I think that at this young age, I was 21 because children and things like that. But I wasn't able to have sex. I wasn't able to have a healthy sexual relationship because of my pain and because of the anomyosis. So bring that in and I say, you know, like this is how it is, but this is what I can do. And, and you know, some people aren't okay with it, but I haven't. I've actually not had since my surgery, since my hysterectomy have an issue with it. There was people before surgery, before my hysterectomy that were more that issues with the unknown of the when they Google it, they see infertility. Um, and so there's more issues of, well, I don't know if I'm comfortable with the fact that you may never be able to have children. And I'm going to come back with the, no one knows if they're going to be able to have children um, in the future. So I'm, it is really good infertility, but it's not done infertility. As we've seen, our co Natalie just had her baby in February. Uh, she, she was quite the struggle. Um, she only had one fallopian tube. And um, but she's able to carry it with adenomyosis. And then I'm, I'm like, I can't get pregnant. And if it's like down that line, I'm just, and then I can't you get pregnant. Thank you. I have an IUD. I'm like, no, I can't get pregnant. And I do a diagram for them as well. Thank you so much. Um, I do see any more questions, but um, if you just want to repeat where people can. Um, find you in case they have any more questions after this, and that would be great. Okay. So, of course, there's the no.co on Instagram. If you go to that, or um, my name is on the presentation, it, my handle is sure underscore Jillian. Uh, I, I just change it from sure to be endo. So, if you go to our website, it'll be a little bit different. So, feel free to message me or message us on the echo, uh, Instagram or webpage. You can email and email also is connected to my Instagram. So if you want to email me, um, absolutely feel free and don't hesitate to reach out. I'm doing a series on my own personal uh, right now about dating with Endo, and there's the highlights on there. So you'll see kind of a little about dating with Endo, and I may do um, a sex tips with Endo as well. Okay, thank you so much for joining us, Jillian, and um, thank you to all the people who attend as well. And we thank will see you next month. Thank you much.